In this episode of the Big Data Beard Podcast, we're joined by certified whiskey sommelier, Anthony Dina, who also works in data analytics at Dell EMC, to talk about why data analytics and whiskey tasting have so much in common. Enjoy. I know what you need for Christmas. <laughs> the, the, a clapper board. <laughs> that would be pretty great. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> With like a little beard where the mustache comes up and then it slams down. Oh my that's yeah. incredible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be could you just imagine how great Oh, that makes me so happy to think about. I just I really can't even do it. You know, seventh, light of merchandise. Seventh grade wood shop. You can do anything. I mean it's incredible. <laughs> well, on that note, we are at Strata Data Conference in San Jose, California, and it's uh, it's it's actually not even day one. Day one is tomorrow. Today is the wrap up of training, but we, meaning Rob Hout, the streaming data scruff, uh, <laughs> is here to join me. <laughs> but we've also got a an awesome guest today, Mr. Anthony Dina. Anthony, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So we've asked Anthony to come on because one. Uh, we like Anthony, uh, but two, he works in big data, but he's also got a sordid past and a even more interesting future, I think. So Anthony, tell us a little bit about what you do. <laughs> well, what brought me here is a dinner. And the reason why I'm uniquely qualified is, um, I'm a whiskey sommelier. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the bio reads data analytics director moonlighting as a whiskey sommelier, but I think it's actually the reverse. Yeah, I was just saying, it's, just, it's, it's better the other way. It's I'm kind of like daylighting at Which, this point. <laughs> it is daylight. We're not drinking whiskey yet. Uh, but Keyword. That's, that's interesting, though, because I, I would argue that most folks in technology generally kind of are sort of interested in whiskey at some level. It's got some, there's some interesting connection points. So you work for Dell as the director of big data. Right. That's the day job. You got a team of folks doing some interesting stuff that we'll get to. Yeah. Um, but the event tonight is uh, is kind of interesting. What is what exactly does a whiskey sommelier do? <laughs> well, we lead people through a journey. Uh, what most people don't understand is that whiskey is a fine craft. The craft distillery has come up through following the craft breweries, and uh, as a result, a lot of attention is put into it. And like anything else, where you have you know, um, something that's complex and worth understanding. Getting a guide to take you through from the beginning to start your inner journey really helps. So a sommelier in many ways is a showman, um, a historian, knowledgeable about the, the craft, and really at the end of the day wants to inspire somebody to go on, uh, on their own. Interesting. So you, you have an interesting background because most folks that we know that work in, in big data certainly don't carry the title Whiskey Sommelier, but they most of them don't come out of the background that I think you kind of educationally in your history isn't the typical tech dude right. working in, in big data. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, so I, I think the real secret is every artist needs a job. And so when I found an identity in sophomore year of high school, I said, I need to draw comic books. I was that nerd. And as a result, spent six years and earned a Master of Fine Arts and then an MBA 10 years later and was at a company called Compaq Computers and fell in love with the idea of, you know, distributed processing, uh, uh, the, the computer science, which then it led to a deep fascination with data analytics. And now I have the pleasure of leading a really an amazing team in the United States focused on things like Splunk and Hadoop and NoSQL and those kinds of things. But, you know, the the, the beginning, quite honestly, is uh, a sense of curiosity. And I think that is the secret to success here. That's more interesting, the question I'm going to ask you. But I had to ask anyway because the keyword jumped off of no, I mean, my head. So comic book. Yeah. So you wanted to draw comic books. Yeah. What was your favorite comic book? Uh, well, X-Men, of course. Oh, good choice. <laughs> Excellent choice. No, I mean, the, the, the coveted uh, issue number is 65, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, I think go. I spent $100 at when I was 13. <laughs> Who has $100 when they're 13? <laughs> it's a lot of the yards to mow. 
That's awesome. But it is funny that you say an artist needs a job because my daughter's convinced she's going to be a painter. And I told my wife, I'm like, well, we should start saving now because we're going to probably pay for her cell phone bill for (laughs) the next 30 (laughs) years or so. Um, So the connection point between art and that creative, you know, energy, it's not lost on the big data community. I've actually seen a bunch of articles and we've referenced those in in previous previous podcasts that you need that creativity to make what's happening in big data, what's happening in, in AI and machine learning connected back to people. And I think that's a kind of an interesting story, that connection point between art and technology. But the connection point between whiskey and data analytics is, I don't know if I know as much about, and I think you, you wrote a blog recently that was about to be published, but we got a chance to read it. So I want to dig into this blog because it connects data analytics and whiskey. So I'm starting to understand whiskey sommelier by day, Dell, no, wait, which one's by day, by night. So, but tell me, understand, like, how did this come about? Why do you think data analytics and whiskey have so much in well, common? Well, so uh, to be clear, every artist and all human beings are pattern recognition machines. The difference between most humans and the art human is that we express it and we do it in a way we train in a way that we're evoking an emotional or intellectual response. And so it became really clear to me sitting in the chair that I have that as I'm going through blind tastings and truly trying to understand what's underneath the surface uh, uh, metaphorically, um, that a lot of those skills and practices actually show up in data science and all the things that are now building up to artificial intelligence. So I threatened uh, my friend Bill Schmarzo that I was and and uh, Wei Lin, data scientist, that I would write this blog, and so I did. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so I actually we got a we got a copy of it, and I like the the preamble, which I can't I can't encourage folks enough to read. It'll be up on the Big Data Beard here shortly. But preamble's great, full of history, love that. But I actually want to dig into the specifics <laughs> of it because you outline ten criteria that are parallels that they have absolute you know, prescience in both whiskey and in data analytics. So the first one you talk about is deductive reasoning. So help me understand why, I mean, obviously I understand deductive reasoning, I think from an analytics perspective, but share your opinion. Well, I mean, look, Sherlock method. Holmes is famous for deductive reasoning, which is the reason why he looked at the strawberry jam on your cuff and imagined that you had an argument with your grandmother or something, right? He, he, could, he could find a, a shred of evidence and link it back to a story. And, Deductive reasoning uh, differs than inductive reasoning. In fact, this was a, a deep conversation I had with Luke Wilson, our new uh, data scientist in our high-performance computing lab. Not the guy from the movies. No. Darn. No. That would have been he, way he cooler, is, I'm he, just going to say. <laughs> if you had like Luke Wilson as a friend, I was like, whoa. Like, you got a sweet necklace and you got Luke Wilson? Come well, on. so we have, this de- <laughs> we have this debate about whether, um, you know, machine learning, deep learning is, a, is an offshoot of high-performance computing or an offshoot off of data analytics. And of course, it all depends on your point of view. And the point of view that I share is, you know, we've been collecting all this click stream of information and we're looking for patterns. We're deducing what's in there. Uh, and what happens on the other side of the equation is that when you have researchers that are deep in theory and they want to prove it true, they'll basically generalize off of a, a, a specific idea, like the protein could be folded this way, and then they'll run a simulation to see if it actually does happen that way. So deductive reasoning comes in the whiskey because we're looking for attributes or features. Interesting. So uh, whiskey, because that's where my brain's at right now. <laughs> um, when you So when you approach a new whiskey, yeah. so looking if you've got that kind of feature set in your head, yeah. um, do you take a like a set of things or, you know, taste and flavors and origins and things into that tasting? Like, I'm looking for these sorts of things. So does origin and ingredients play into your idea of what it might taste like before Ooh, you ever bring is it, it bias do you walk yeah. in your whiskey yeah, you do have bias. a cognitive bias which is why a blind testing is is helpful because just like the voice where all of the artists are looking away you can't hear by the way that was not a new idea that was something that was used in europe to make sure that we were evenly balanced between male and female performers uh so yeah uh, you can come up with a bias um i think the 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 key is uh, really looking for something different and really anticipating. One of the things that I've, I have talked with my fellow sommeliers, and it hit me uh, pretty hard when uh, a good friend of mine named Kate Van Nam lifted her glass of Highland Park 12 and announced to the world in her description, the sea salt, because it's 
positioned on an island north of north of Scotland. So far north, the Vikings had more say in inhabiting them than the Gauls did. But what's interesting about this whole discussion, because I was leading her through a practice of matching it to food, is that she has something I do not, which is spice blindness. So spice blindness is this description of not having the the vocabulary and experience that a somebody who spent a lot of time in the kitchen. So I can detect a tarragon versus a basil easily. For many, it just tastes like grass. So <laughs> just or, tastes or, like lawn. By the way, is it weird? Have you heard the the spice blindness, the spice blindness where uh, cilantro tastes like soap? Yeah. Yes. That to me is so, unreal. Yeah. Like, All right. That one is... I, can, that's can I, I, I can't get so, Corey, weed. <laughs> so, Corey, can I level with you? Oh, please do. Are you one of those? I have now about 10 times told everybody that Corey Minton is like cilantro. 20% of the population <laughs> feels he's like soap. But 80% <laughs> of us absolutely love it. I can't have enough. I'm not making this up. Oh. Hold on. I'm just, I, I'm I, coming I like clean. It. Oh. Yeah. That's incredible. Did you not? I, I, I did not. I've never, I didn't I never told you that? No. Nope. no all right. <laughs> That's, I like that it's at least not 50-50, so I'm good with no, that. We need a new sticker now. <laughs> yeah, no. Just me as cilantro. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love that. So you actually brought up a good point, which was your secondary, the second of your 10 points, which was this idea of feature detection or feature selection. So help me understand, like, how does... How does that, what do, you, what do you mean in the whiskey context and how's that connected to analytics? All right. So for a whiskey perspective, you think of a flavor wheel as a series of concentric circles. In the center are major categories like medicinal, wood, smoke, um, uh, fruit. And the, as the rings progress, they get broken down and be more specific. What you're looking for is key attributes uh, to the to the flavor profile, and that can not just be the specific aromas and flavors that come off the spirit, but it could be the viscosity, the color, and those are uh, things that we can compare. And and that relates back to analytics because at the end of the day, a lender wants to know: Are you worthy of a mortgage? And so, uh, let me just ask you: Here's a pop quiz for you. Uh, name, according to Dansk Bank in Denmark, uh, one of the top features or qualities that will determine that you think absolutely that will repay your loan uh education level that helps yep come on rob uh credit rating time. I was credit rating absolutely that's 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 one but it's time time in time employed in a single job yes that that those are all very helpful <laughs> but they're not the but most not indicative because <laughs> there's a rating right do you have a relationship with the bank or not. See, now when I say it, it's like, oh yeah, of course, duh. Yeah. But sometimes it takes math to figure that out. And of course, the data analytics is interesting because when you have lots and lots of, of data points, you can't process it on your own, which is why it's kind of an interesting topic. But the process itself of, of detecting this, this pattern, is we do this all the time. So the likelihood that I'm going to buy a rye whiskey has a lot to do with my relationship with old fashions. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> okay. Okay. How many, how many episodes have matched? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay. So then the next topic that you said was similar was classification. Why is classification interesting in the whiskey context? Like what, what are we doing there? Well, it can kind of help you understand. So for me, a classification is useful for pairings. So for example, rye, has a certain quality. A lot of rye to me, like the bullet rye, which I favor, is not only lemon in its nose, but it has a kind of a licorice-like quality. So I know that anything that might hint at licorice is going to go with the bullet rye. So it's a class of whiskey that I would determine, if, you know, if it's a certain profile in this profile. It's what Netflix is doing. So Netflix is saying, we classify you as a kind of person who likes certain things. Therefore, try this movie out. Is it a way of taking large groups and kind of clustering them together is that what you mean by classification like yeah. large group of whiskeys these kind of have this thing in common so they correct oh okay that and the sense. purpose is as, as i mentioned is to deal with them in a wholesale fashion to say and you look the easy one is birth cohorts you were born before 1980 you're gen xer if, if you were born in the 50s you were a, a, a boomer uh, and those are cliche in, in many regards unless you're dealing with biology issues like 
I don't know. You might want Metamucil or something. <laughs> Actually, I saw one in the airport today that said something like 75% of people with hepatitis C were born between like 1955 and 1965 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Interesting. Vascodilators do really well with older people. Before we get on to the next topic, there was something about the data classification piece, and I think we're going to speak on it later, um, but I wanted to ask now, like in the, the idea of sort of general bulk declassification, do we do you tend to lose, and this applies both in the data and the whiskey, I think, a little bit, do you lose the outliers? Do they get smoothed out or hard to find or... No, well, so the, uh, the, the traditional statistics... Look at that stopping by and saying hi, Tom Lyon, alumni of the Big Data Beard Show. <laughs> nice to see you, bud. <laughs> this is the fun no, part of the recording at a conference. Yeah, so the, the fun part about uh, outliers is, um, well, number one, in the world of statistic, outliers are, are just a pain in the neck. So we, we cut them out because it skews the, the outcome. In the world of data analytics, modern data analytics, we include them because we can learn stuff from them. Uh, you know, there have there have been lots of products that were never designed for what they are, but they're being used. And if you if you like doubt what? that, oh, products that aren't being used as they were intended, yeah, like what? Well, you ask ask Pfizer about Viagra. It was originally designed Wait, for. No, that, I'm not in that classification yet. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> no, but seriously, was it designed to do something else? It was designed to lower blood pressure. It does that, I think. That's good. <laughs> By moving the blood in a certain direction. Excellent. That's brilliant. No, it's a vasodilator. It's meant to uh, expand yeah. the blood flow. I was thinking of the one um, in a material science class. They told us about the story of uh, sticky notes at 3M. Yeah. The dude was trying to create like a something to replace super glue, but he messed up and he made this like sticky stuff that kind of just didn't stick all that yeah. well, but a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so they applied it to paper and now we have sticky notes. That's right. Okay. So the next one you had was propensity. Now, that's a fun word. I don't use that. I like words like that. Propensity. <laughs> I have a propensity. It, it's, it's a fancy word. It means you're likely to do something. Okay. Uh, and it usually comes with a rating, like a percentage. You know, it's like, hey, we have a propensity, you know, a 75%, uh, 75% propensity to rain. It means out of 75 possible or 100 possible instances, 75 will come true. It's important if you're dealing with issues of loyalty and, and from a customer perspective, um, and so propensity comes in the play uh, of whiskey, and we kind of talked about the, the matching, that if something is like something, um, and you know if A goes with B and B goes with C, then A is likely to go with C. It, it's a propensity oh. kind of score. All right. So then iteration is your next one. So iteration means... Other uh, than drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, I think yeah, that's, yeah. that's inebriation. That's, yeah, that's no, no. One. So in this particular context... Uh, if you if you ever have a chance to meet the chief data officer for um, uh, I'm going to say Home Alone, um, Home Away, Home Away, okay, um, not Home Away, um, the service that allows you to rent a bed, Airbnb, Airbnb. If you meet the there chief data officer, Airbnb, he'll tell you that he works for founders that went to the same school I did, Rhode Island School of Design, and the challenging part is the amount of iteration. Uh, and think of A and B um, uh, testing. Uh, think about how many colors of, of blue that Facebook has put on or Amazon put on to make sure we get the right reaction. And this level of iteration uh, and experimentation, which comes from, you know, like right up the road, design thinking, where you're trying to slowly make it better. And uh, if you look at a, a brilliant producer, Compass Box, a Connecticut guy who's who's got a distillery, I wouldn't call it a story. He's a wine, he's a whiskey maker by taking other people's product, blending it in his way, maybe re-aging it or aging it longer. He'll make new products. So he's constantly uh, trying to, as they say, perfect the blender's arts and create a new experience. Hey, so, so have you dabbled much in whiskey blending on your own? Have you? That's level four in the whiskey uh, school. Yeah. Oh, is that that's next? You're yeah, you're not level up. four yet? Nope. Do the, so it's levels. It's not like colors of belt. Like you don't get a gold one. Like your bronze now. The next. Well, I know. I, I know you've been eyeballing uh, the uh, six pound bronze medallion. It's incredible. Right here. Right, I need, need one of those. I, well, I, I mean, know, it's, it looks like it, whatever it took to get that is totally <laughs> worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but as as each level progresses, you'll get a different um, accoutrement. So the first is a just a plain black ribbon with the. Bronze medallion. The chain comes in level two. The the star here is level three. 
I'm expecting a cup, <laughs> a shaker, or maybe a, an ice bag for the head. I don't know what comes next. <laughs> Bottle of Excedrin. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but speaking of iteration, it's funny talking about blenders because that's something that we're seeing in the data science world now get interesting is the not just the idea of running multiple iterations to simulate something, which obviously the ubiquity of compute resources now, the power of computing, the scale out frameworks has enabled kind of this new scale of, of iteration. Um, but it's also this this concept of like iterating against new features, iterating and blending not just one model, but many, many models. And that's what I think you're after with the whiskey thing. I start to make that connection because one, one of the things we talked with the guys from um, – a data robot and their their whole thing is they try to help you build predictive models faster right so they, they automate a lot of the model process and one of the things they do a good job of is they blend like it's not just a convolutional neural net or a you know a you know a decision you know or what do they call them gradient boosted trees or a random forest it might be many of those dependent upon the features yeah and the, so, so it's like the answer it's basically yeah. it's the mutual fund of models it's yeah, the, right the yeah, they, call, they call it yeah. ensembling so like is in It'd whiskey be a fund of funds <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. exactly so in in whiskey do you see that is there that ensembling that happens where you're bringing multiple kinds together, multiple like aging processes. Well, it was the, it was the damn a English that really <laughs> caused it. They couldn't handle the single malts, um, so the lowland uh, producers started blending them to broaden the palate. Um, our friend, you know, Tito Beverage out of Texas uh, wanted to make a very attractive whiskey. I'm sorry, a very attractive vodka. So he wound up picking corn as for his mash bill to make a vodka experience. And that's really what you make moonshine and moonshine is the precursor for whiskey. So it's all about approachability. And, um, but the blending and the, and the experimentation is about getting a dipper, uh, uh, a different and deeper experience. Are you guys familiar with the concept of an infinity bottle? By the way, uh, it sounds incredible and I'd like one. I like to well, drive an infinity, but I don't know about the affinity. Well, it was the it infinity is, bottle or affinity yeah, bottle. It was a first described as an infinity bottle. So okay. it's the bottle that you have in your house that you then start to as the leftovers of whatever you have, you start to blend together. Oh, so that it kind of is then yours. Yeah, we call that time. blend again. So if you go yeah. to the to the whiskey marketing school, whatever is not f finished, and yeah. the glasses get dumped into a, a cask, and you need a little courage to just you know sip some swell like that but it's it's uh it is a technicolor rainbow yeah it's it's, it's apparently a, a if bit of see that. Off, yeah. yeah it'd be kind of fun I mean, if, as long as you mix a bunch of whiskeys that you generally like i have to well it'd be ones you would have in your house normally. yeah right? so it wouldn't like, be stuff you did <laughs> hopefully it's not like going to the bar and like i don't I remember in college they had the oh the, the bar mat right you remember that like oh. the over pouring of the shots you could actually drink the yeah 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 oh. What was the, 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 the movie? <laughs> the movie where the guy drank the 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 wine bucket from. Oh, no, <laughs> you're talking about <laughs> the spit bucket. The, the, yeah, spit bucket. <laughs> Gross. No, oh, that's, no, no. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. that's worse than the bar mat. That's, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> it's got saliva blended in there. That's, that's hot. <laughs> What's the next question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the so the next one you talked about was which uh, in this case I would. <laughs> we need to be supervised is supervised learning or establishing a baseline. So what does that mean in whiskey? Like, what do you, what do you mean establishing a baseline? Well, uh, you know what you like? Yeah. How did you, how did you know you, you liked it? You tried I it. I trained myself. <laughs> you like, you tried it. You tried a few times. Yeah. And you understood that. Yeah. I generally like, you know, cheese pizza. So I'm going to have cheese pizza. So that's my baseline. And then you go out and you say, look, I know I'm going to the, uh, to this new restaurant, new town, and I'm going to try this cheese pizza because you are looking to establish, is this one any better than the last 105 I've ever had? Um, in the world of, of analytics, we do that, but we're doing this in, the, in a way where we're taking a set of data and known outcomes. And we're asking the algorithms to determine which of the aspects or features will lead to this particular outcome. And this is useful, let's say... If you are trying to determine cardiac disease and you're looking at blood pressure, triglyceride levels, et cetera, you're establishing a baseline. And we, and we used to do this, you know, mechanically, um, manually, and now we've got computers to do it super fast. Excellent. Okay. And then when you learn things, you look for anomalies. And that was your point number seven. So anomaly detection 
Yeah, no, like, anomalies. Are we looking for just stinky whiskey, like like no, in the wine world. What are we looking for? No, anomalies get a. As I said in the post, they get a bad rap. You know, I, I have a good friend who says every parent wants their kid to be normal, but they never want their kid to be average. <laughs> and it's the same. It's the same thing. Have you heard the term uh, "pig" for describing your children, <laughs> no. or for like me describing your children? Parent identified gifted. <laughs> They're pigs. Exactly. <laughs> I like that though. Everybody wants their kid to be normal, just not average. Right. Right. And so, you know, uh, anomalies are sort of the uh, the function of a talent scout. Right? We're looking for things that are unusual. Um, and in, in the world of, of whiskey and whiskey uh, aficionados, if you've listened to pop music and the same beat, you're looking for a fresh take a fresh approach a way to and uh, you know enliven or awaken and and you know i i remember drinking wine i know that <laughs> maybe hearsay but there are some wines that have a banana like quality green spot as an example has a green apple now you might say well it's the green on the front that might suggest it but i swear it's like a jolly ranch uh, uh, jolly rancher green apple candy have you tried uh clyde mays alabama style whiskey no it's it's made by a, a distillery in um, in Kentucky, but it's made to a to a recipe that was an old Alabama um, like moonshiner, and it got really popular. It's actually very highly rated in a lot of the things. But one of the things their their main Alabama style whiskey, green apple all the way. Like it's a bourbon that literally tastes like a green Jolly Rancher. Yeah, <laughs> it's delightful. I have to look it up. And yeah. Goins the same way, right? I mean, it's it's that I I cook this malt on top of a stainless steel sheet with heat as opposed to smoke, and so I just get that fruitiness on the grain. Same thing with the wheat beer, right? There's a little bit of that citrus back end, so you get that sort of tart flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got all excited now. He's ready, he's ready to go to the, uh, to the bartender. Bar. Bring free. Yeah, no kidding. So, so anomalies are interesting uh, for finding something new. But do they help us find something that we don't want to do, like a bad thing? It, it can be. No, for sure. Uh, so, particularly if you look at IoT use cases and you're looking at temperature ranges, um, any kind of telemetry. If you are noticing that a driver is veering off course, or uh, you know, an aircraft in its sortie is didn't follow the route. You're gonna you're gonna ask why, yeah. and, and and that's the and and this is a brilliant uh, post by friends Jeffrey and Brian Eisenberg talked about the need for the human element, the human story behind the data because that's usually when things come alive. Yeah, absolutely. So normalization is your point number eight. So I th- I don't know enough about normalization. Tell me what you mean. <laughs> Because I'm now, not normal. you looked in the mirror, <laughs> there's nothing about normal <laughs> that's going to come coming shooting back out of that glass. That's right. No, a normalization is a process by which we want to kind of even things up. If you want to draw a conclusion or an average or, or, or some kind of mathematical result, you don't want empty cells. You know, you want all the zip codes filled in so that you can make a, a, a strong conclusion. Uh, when you compare anything, you want an even playing field. If you're comparing art, you want the lighting to be the same. If you're driving a car, drive on the same road. If you're tasting whiskey, choose the same glass, the same pour, and let it be in the glass the same amount of time. So it's it, not only normalization of like the data. So in the data side, it's like data wrangling, kind of yeah. normalizing, maybe making some inferences to fill out your data set to come up with the achieved objective. Yeah. But in the whiskey sense, what you just said that I need to drink out of the same glass at the same temperature. Help me unpack that. What does that mean? Like how much impact does that sort of thing have on whiskey? Because I don't. I don't abide that <laughs> at home. No, no, no. So, so for example, and this is what we do classically, although tonight we're choosing four, uh, pick three whiskeys, put them in a similar shaped glass because uh, most of what you're experiencing is the volatiles that come off the whiskey and that's lifted by the alcohol. And there's three things like any perfumer will tell you. There's a top note, a heart note, and a bottom note. And if you've got different rates of evaporation and you're trying to compare you know, single malts or Irish whiskey, you'll have a completely different experience. So it's it really behooves you to, to try to think like a scientist and, and try to keep it clean, keep as many variables out. So it's not only normalizing the data, normalizing experiences, normalizing the collection process. Um, do we also normalize what is referred to or how much of impact does things like letting a whiskey sit the glass choice based on the kind of the bulb shape in terms of the like you said the evaporation sure. how much does that, does that affect what is lovingly referred to as the kentucky hug you know that good warm feeling you get all down in your chest when you have a drink of strike whiskey well okay so uh, you know the primary component of of a spirit is the is is alcohol 
Um, there are different kinds of alcohol, and they try to take the, the bad alcohol out first. Those are the low wines, and they get to the high wines. But when it comes to a, a spirit itself, it can be served at different concentrations of alcohol. Cast strength tends to be above 100, not typically above 120 proof. And like anything else, uh, if you're not accustomed to loud rock music and you down it, as an example, you're not going to hear it. If you don't eat spicy Thai food and you come from Bangkok and you eat something, you're not going to taste the flavor. So it's really important to try to level out and balance out, which is why if you are doing a comparison with something that is high alcoholic at cask strength whiskey against others that are not, it makes sense to add a little water because you want to be able to experience it and get it down. And you'll know um, over time what your ABV tolerance or preference is. That's the alcohol by volume. Um, but yeah, uh, so the shape of the glass makes a big difference because uh, it evaporates differently in each glass, the amount of alcohol. And I, I you know, I didn't know this, but, you know, going through a, an exercise on comparing distillation uh, techniques and trying to really understand how it changes the flavor profile, I would sit <laughs> quite a long time with three Irish whiskeys. And what I noticed that in the first five minutes, uh, the personality was much different in 50 minutes. And the good ones, uh, like, you know, any good character in a novel, emerged, transformed, and deeper to experience. The, the ones that aren't as interesting turn out to be a lot more flat. And they started settling down to just one or two basic notes, and the, and the higher quality or the more enjoyable didn't. What's your favorite tasting glass or type of the, glass? The Glen Cairn yeah. glass, okay. of course. Yeah. I don't know what that is. So Glen, <laughs> <You'll find out. laughs> Glen glass kind of looks like a little uh, hurricane glass. Oh, okay. Glen, yeah, it's a little bulb. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. I dig it. Now, the next one, number nine, is enrichment. So enrichment in the data world means don't just have one set of data. It means having multiple sources of data so that you have more context, right, so you can understand the overall environment. That's, that's right. Help me understand what that means to whiskey. <laughs> well, uh so kind of going back to the blender's arts and to the choices we make when we uh, make the product. So take a producer like Hudson. Uh, it's not advertised, but if you go in enough circles, you'll hear that they're choosing different size barrels with different char qualities with different. Ca they're using these different aspects to ladder up or layer up and much in the way a chef will do it. So they'll take something like an apple pie. They'll introduce an, an, an unusual spice like we see down at uh, Laundrette in Austin, Texas. She makes an apple pie with sage, which is usually the size you have with roast chicken. And then, uh, you know, put something in the whipped cream that might be, um, you know, vanilla, uh, some cinnamon, so, some other things. And, and in combination, you go, whoa, what is all going on here? And you can do this in the spirit world, too. So it'd be kind of like, uh, kind of like a scotch that's been aged in a sherry. Correct. Cask sometimes. Yeah. 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 And now we're seeing triple cask. On top of that, uh, certainly Johnny Walker and, and the rest of the old-timey blenders were doing much of that. Mm -hmm. It's funny. You said in the first part of the, the open, you said something about how craft distillers kind of followed the craft brewery yeah. scene. Yeah. And uh, I just saw a commercial this week from uh, our friends at Jameson, which <laughs> not, I don't know if they produce how you feel about Jameson, but they have, uh, they've jumped on the bandwagon of the popularity of the IPA. Yeah, and they've got now they're now they're they're advertising a Jameson whiskey that has been aged in IPA barrels. No, this is this is like Reese's. You got IPA in my whiskey. No, you get whiskey in my IPA. You'll find it going both directions. <laughs> That's awesome. So the last point, which I think is interesting because it has absolutely nothing to do with taste, but it has to do with the world around whiskey and analytics, which is that both whiskey and big data have been shaped. By taxation. Unpack that for me. <laughs> so tax has done a lot. I mean, certainly we our country is founded by representation um, because without, uh, I mean, lack of representation with, with, the tax, uh, with taxation. And what's important here is that terms like bottled and bond, which was a way of paying the taxes later. Um, things like the fact that the Whiskey Rebellion, which we can thank the Broadway star Hamilton for doing as is, as the first secretary of treasury, all of those things changed and, and, and really energized the uh, people. And as a result, you know, things like uh, the little label 
uh, that surrounds the top that you go, you know, why do we have this little piece of decoration? It doesn't prevent me to, from getting into the, well, that's to prove the tax was paid on that bottle. So it does shape uh, much of the, you know, uh, consumption patterns, uh, how we experience it, and and to some degrees, uh, even change some of the recipes. But in the world of analytics, we came upon uh, uh, statistics and, and counting and math because, you know, kings wanted to know how many citizens there were, and they wanted to charge the tax accordingly. And that process took uh, more than a decade. So uh, we get things like statistics because we can't wait 10 years to do a census or we can't count everybody even in the 10 year time horizon. So there this this need for commerce and for and di- dividing resources evenly and paying for the government services aka taxation has an impact on both sides. So one to take that a step further, I would say that they have another thing in common which is not just shaped by taxation but shaped by regulation. Yeah. Right? Because if you think about the the history of many of the whiskies that are popular in America today, they're based on Prior to prohibition, they're based on just people in small parts of the world that were underpopulated that didn't have access to the logistics to get good bottled whiskey in town. They would make their own in these, you know, pot stills out in the middle of the woods. And then whenever prohibition happened, they obviously became highly in demand because then they were producing whiskey outside the purview of the government. And then data analytics, kind of the same thing. Like if you think about a lot of the topics we're talking about today are based on government regulation. Like it's Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How are we going to continue to look at enriching and having multiple data sources in context of things like GDPR, right? How are we going to control data access and security with the fact that, I mean, we've seen data valuations that have been like people are saying data is valued at billions of dollars for corporations. Uh, And there's multiple examples that that I think we can, we can list, but there, that becomes a risk also. Right. And so I think it's with whiskey, same thing, right? you have these risks associated with, how does the government, you know, are they going to shut down and not allow it to be sold in certain places? It's interesting. Just make, maybe maybe we'll add that one to the blog and put my name. Well, yeah, yeah, abso- absolutely. So one of the, <laughs> one of the things you, you may find out is that uh, at a point in the 18th century, the English government was paying uh, narcs is what we would call them. We would pay people to turn in uh, stills because you're, you were being taxed on the size of the still. And what they didn't realize is that the Scots were so crafty that they were taking old, unusable stills, selling it to the government, taking the money and building a new one. Well, it was that period of time that actually really shrunk down the the uh, the whole Scotch industry, right? I mean, there there were, if I recall, um, and I forget the number, but the number of distilleries before that and then after. Like, it's kind of what happened during Prohibition here almost, right? That they, a lot of them crashed and burned and just went by the wayside. To where we're left with just a kind of a handful of what the old Scotch distilleries that are still around. Yeah, I mean, look, we've seen we've seen uh, expansion and contraction a few times. War was a major factor, as much of the grains had to be used for uh, rations. Uh, we knew that uh, up in the Highlands, in particular, uh, women were oftentimes in charge of creating the spirits because the men were out trying to get independence from the southern uh, part of the island. So, yeah, there's a lot of of the human condition, if you will, that will factor into this. But one thing for sure, we didn't give up the promise or the effort to try to have it. <laughs> no one ever said, hey, it's war. We're not going to yeah. have this. No, no, no. no. no you need it when you come this. home. So I do. So that I love the conversation. This is super fun. Now, one thing that you're going to be doing when you leave here is you're going to run and be part of an event. Um, and it's I think it's a it's a Dell EMC Intel, Cloudera, and MasterCard sponsored event. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing there and what's going to be talked about. Yeah, we have uh, about 96 people registered, which is probably wow. the largest whiskey tasting I have ever seen, much less delivered. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, uh, the, uh, well, nerves there? N- no. Uh, <laughs> what makes me nervous is being able to stand in a central location so, every, so I can be heard. Yeah. Um, now, the idea is. Uh, you know, as we just discussed in the blog, what's really topical right now is things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and whiskey. We want peer-to-peer conversations. Our friends at Intel, who have been design partners uh, for many, many years, uh, we have a rich partnership with with Mastercard Nick Kuru. You know, uh, shout out to, to Nick. Um, Cloudera, we've had a, a partnership since 2011. Uh, we recognize the importance of Hadoop uh, early. 
and so we're and we're so we're coming together to kind of share what we know, and we have a hidden guest. Um, I don't want to announce it because he, he may have plane troubles, but we have somebody from the inside of Dell Technologies who's leading the data science team, who's actually applying the convolutional networks to solve some really basic problems to add a, a more valuable service. And so we're hoping he uh, he can make it and share. Sweet. Share some stories. I dig that. So then I want to talk a little bit about the team that you lead because you, I know we've talked about whiskey mostly here, but you do lead a team of, of specialized technical resources that I think folks that are that are in and around the space, they're thinking about investments in, you know, infrastructure to support some of these next generation applications, these new analytical capabilities. They need to know that there's people out there that can help. And it sounds like based on what I know about your team, that's kind of what they do. Tell us a little bit more about what your team's about and, and what they do for your customers. Yeah. So the, the, the team was formed to support the uh, advancement of modern analytics through things like Hadoop and NoSQL. Uh, when we started this journey uh, many years ago, we had some really basic questions about how do I get started? What kind of use case should I have? How do I configure this thing? Uh, over time, we've seen customers mature. They started putting in fast data or streaming. Uh, they're now exploring at the upper end of the maturity model with things like uh, GPU technology. And they're asking fundamental questions of what's the best way of doing it? How do I maximize my spend? And what the team does is because, you know, uh, we get around. We can share experiences across the industry. We can share experiences from customer to customer. And our job is a 100% dedicated to this topic. We work at an infrastructure and services-oriented company, and we get to do this. And I mean get to do this. It's a real treat to be able to uh, to spend time and be solely focused on that. Oh, that's awesome. That's super useful because I do know, obviously, working with your team, customers do have some interesting questions. And there's some things that are happening within companies like Dell EMC that are investments that are being made with partners like Intel and NVIDIA that I think are going to be super interesting to customers, to our partners in the years ahead. Yeah. So one of the things, uh, Corey, I'm just kind of leaving it uh, there because I'm, I'm pushing our, our data scientists upstream that are helping develop the the bundles for machine learning and deep learning. So we've got a project now. We've got about 12 or so specific use cases, and we're taking those use cases and we're breaking them down into constituents Parts. I'm calling it the prime factorization. You know, like the number 64 can be broken down into prime numbers, 2 times 3 times 2 times 2. And, and so most problems uh, that involve data analytics can be broken down into a similar function. And so we're going through an exercise now to be able to take some of these really popular use cases like um, detailed and optimized knowledge management, uh, uh, the race for fixing things or curing disease. We're trying to take those things down into its constituent parts to make sure that the technology supports it in a way, and then we can we can democratize uh, this approach. So that's what we're working on right now. I'm hoping that I can come back and share the results of that at another time. Absolutely. Well, I will say, folks, we uh, we are going to be pu publishing, actually, Anthony is going to be publishing on the Big Data Beard, the full blog about the reasons why whiskey and data analytics have more in common than you think. But I do want to shift gears. We have, uh, we have a section of our show that we do with every guest. Uh, it's called Rapid Fire. And what I want you to do is sit back, relax. I wish you had some whiskey. Yeah. Uh, but uh, sit back, relax. and I've, just... I've heard the, the rapid fire. Oh, so you're <laughs> prepared. Oh, no. You're I'm not have... prepared. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm nervous. Oh, uh, so I was waiting for prepared answers. I know. This is, this is a problem. We have, we have people that I'm like, oh, my God. Them. He's going to ask me about my favorite music. And I'm like, oh, who am I going to think of? Because I blank out of those things. Well, actually, we're going to ask you one to start because, uh, because of the topical nature of our conversation. Sure. Favorite bourbon. Oh, uh, does it have to be just bourbon or, or can it be rye too? It can, okay, we'll expand it, Rye. American whiskey, we'll say. Oh, well, I, uh, you know, the real treat for me is the rum cast rye from Angel's Envy. Okay, excellent, very cool. What year do you think Skynet will go online? <laughs> 2020. 2020, it's coming soon. Uh, what's the uh, the best book you've read recently? Uh, ooh, good one. Um, so I've just finished the Wind Up Bird Chronicles, and I like kind of like the way the Japanese have a very fanciful way of, uh, of uh, kind of exploring. Um, I like Evolve Your Brain by uh, Joe Dispenza, which talks about the biological and chemical reasons why we have emotions. 
So there are a few out there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, what genre of music are you currently rocking? <laughs> I have had a resurgence of listening to Lyle Lovett. So I've rediscovered the Texas sound being in Austin, Texas. So I'm really enjoying that. Oh, Lyle Lovett. Go back. Keep getting the Robert O'Keefe. Oh, yeah, I'm with you, bro. I went to school in Texas, and I grew up there. I'm from there. I'm native Texan, so I get it. What is your favorite piece of generally useless technology? <laughs> oh, oh boy. Uh, I don't know. There, there's so many that's so useful. <laughs> well, you don't have an Apple Watch, which is the leader in the clubhouse. Like More people than not have said uh, Apple Watch. It's, it is entirely useless. It's ridiculous. No, I think uh, yeah, I, I always go to the... To, you know, kitchen stuff. So single purpose kitchen items. Yeah. Uh, but we, t- we tend not to, uh, not, to, not to collect those. So there you go. What is your biggest personal money pit right now? Besides bronze medals. <laughs> <laughs> no, besides the, uh, outside of the kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There you go. That is, no, it's, it's, it's definitely the pool. I swear. The only thing that keeps me, uh, maintaining it as I just imagined it's a giant cocktail that just constantly needs re swizzling. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm so not interested. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, are you going anywhere exceptionally interesting soon? Well, we're going to head to Breckenridge to hit the slopes. Sweet. Yeah, that's happening next week. They had some good snow lately? Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. Uh, and then, last question What show are you currently or recently binging on? Uh, Stranger Things. Oh, good choice. Are yeah, you through no, season two yet? I'm just starting season two. Oh. I, I'm trying to follow what the kids recommend because, you know, you want to read their books and watch their shows so you have a connection. You're a great dad. <laughs> proof that you can enjoy whiskey and be a good father. Thank goodness. Well, Anthony has been super awesome to have you on, bud. I highly encourage folks to, uh, to check out the blog by Anthony about the things that whiskey and data analytics have in common. If folks want to find you in social, follow you, keep up with what you're up to, what are the best ways to, uh, to connect with you? I'm on Twitter uh, uh, at Aunt Dina. That's A-N-T-D-I-N-A. Um, certainly, we'll put in the show notes all the contacts for the team yeah, for and sure. for me. But yeah, LinkedIn, you name it. So, and, and uh, you know, Dell has a pretty robust um, communication vehicle. So, We'll be talking through those channels, too. Absolutely. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. This was awesome to talk with you about why whiskey and analytics have more in common than you think. Thanks for listening.